All right, um, <clears throat> so we've been doing this for three plus years now. I think we've done about 12, 13, 14 events. Um, when we first started doing this thing, uh, we did one in Seattle at the very first KubeCon, and essentially it looked like this. It was lots of stuff about cloud, very little about any of these sort of use cases and stories. It was a lot of the kind of technology, and we were kind of just hoping that, tech, that Kubernetes would survive at that point in time. It was very cloudy, kind of the vision of it was very cloudy, but the technology was, was the front and center of what we did. Um, this is a little bit of what it's looked like over the last couple of years. Um, the event's grown 10x, so thank you very much for spending eight hours with us in moderately comfortable chairs. Um, we're very thankful for that. We're thankful for everybody who's new. Um, it's been a really good event for us to help get to know the community. We're seeing a lot of faces that come back, so that part's really awesome. Um, we feel like the event now it looks more like this. It's, it's sort of the clouds are in the background, the stories of what people are doing, the, the what's possible is very much visible into what's going on. And I always say this, there wasn't as much this week, I was sort of surprised, but usually the end of every one of our, of our customer talks end with, and we're hiring. Um, this has been sort of the, the list of companies that have been willing to come up and tell their story. Um, and I always highlight to people, if somebody is in your industry that you see up here talking, usually that means they're a couple of years into this process, they're a couple of years into developing software faster, getting products and projects to market faster. Um, this should be sometimes a wake-up call as to kind of judging your company against where the rest of the industry is. Now, people ask all the time, okay, you're doing a talk called The Road Ahead. Is The Road Ahead going to be lots of brownfield stuff? Are we just doing lift and shift of applications? To a certain extent, you saw a little bit of that. Um, is the road ahead going to be lots of green fields that maybe a lot of sort of barriers along the way or sort of narrow things we can do? Yeah, there'll be a little bit of that. Um, or is the road ahead going to be, you know, somewhat more green field, maybe less barriers, but the future's a little bit foggy? Yeah, I think you heard some of that as well. So all of these could sort of be applied to what does the future look like for whether it's Kubernetes or OpenShift or what you're trying to do. I hope what you took away from today very much was there's a lot of opportunities in terms of the types of applications that you can automate, that you can scale, that you can make beneficial for your business. We heard this quote this week, I was, or not this week, last week I was at a, a, an executive briefing and somebody came up to us and they said, um, you know, we're, uh, we've been to your events before. We came to Commons a couple of years ago and we sat in the audience and we just took notes. Like, we weren't an OpenShift customer at the time. They were like one of you that was new to this. And they said, we sat there for the eight hours or whatever it was and took notes. And they came to us last week and said, we have 100 different development groups in production doing things against OpenShift, right? Hopefully that doesn't mean it's gonna take you two years to get there, but hopefully the knowledge that you took away from today and hopefully the people that you got to meet are gonna be beneficial in some way that's similar to this. Um, in terms of where do we think this is going, I think we believe we're in sort of the third era of where Kubernetes is. Um, that seems a little bit unusual for something that's five years old, but this space moves fairly quickly and we've made some fairly big jumps. I think we've jumped from what was very early. We were a little, people were worried it was a Google project. Was it going to be the next reader? Was it gonna be the next groups? Or was it gonna be the next big thing? We had to make sure it was open source. We had to make sure it got into stable governance and so forth. We moved from there to being able to do both really new applications stateless to being able to lift and shift, doing stateless applications, having a bunch of different patterns. And I think what you're seeing today and what you're hearing people say they're looking to move towards is the stuff that's going to move us to a whole nother level of automation, a whole nother level of operator technology that's going to just make things sort of work. Um, and that's really the beginning of what we're into right now. What we've tried to do over the last 16, 18 months um, part of it was part of the CoreOS acquisition, part of it was just getting really good feedback from, from our customers, is in essence they said whether or not we're going to be in our public environment, public cloud environment, whether we're going to be in our private data center environment or some mix of it, we would like you more and more to be thinking that the experience that we did with, Uber, with OpenShift should be as it is like in the public cloud. And so I hope you saw somewhat today, uh, we'll talk in the AMA session, it was very much about we want operations to be somewhat uh, simplified. We want to be able to do more things without operations feeling like they're always juggling things. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing things with standards and, and interoperability. We want to make sure things are portable. 
Um, we want to be able to deliver on demand. You know, we heard people talk about we're delivering so much on demand, we're not exactly sure kind of where our job starts and, and stops. I think the way to read that is less about are you working yourself out of a job and are you being a great product manager, right? When our product managers come up here and talk, the biggest thing we want to be able to do is get out of the way of you being able to use the product. When you start doing that, when we make the product easy enough to use, we're doing our job. That's what you're doing when you enable self-service. Obviously, we want it to be secure. We want it to have broad application support. I think you're going to hear that or you heard that uh, throughout the week. The other thing that you're going to hear throughout the week over and over again is this idea of operators. Um, operators is a concept that got started back when we did that very first event at KubeCon. Uh, Brandon Phillips, who at the time was at CoreOS, said, hey, there's no reason that Kubernetes can't run Kubernetes. And it's expanded beyond just Kubernetes running Kubernetes to Kubernetes running all of the internal processes, you know, OpenShift 4, but it's also going to be a really big part of more complicated applications. So we took, you know, we saw Spark demonstrations today, but lots of other things uh, running on top of OpenShift in highly automated ways. The simplest way to, to think about this or to explain this to somebody who says, like, what does operators mean? Here it is. If you went out to the public cloud today and you signed up for a database as a service, you get a database, and on the back end, you don't get a DBA. You get software that runs that database all the time. It makes sure it's always available. It makes sure it gets updated. That's what operators do, except operators allow you to do that for a whole bunch of applications. You go out to operatorhub.io, you'll see those, and anywhere you want to. So you're not tied to any specific cloud or any specific environment. You can take that as a service anywhere you want to, consistency. So, there's one other thing that comes up all the time when people come to these events is they go, you guys do this weird thing where you say Kubernetes and then you say OpenShift and, you know, should I just use the stuff that's upstream or should I, you know, should I use OpenShift? You know, we want new stuff. New stuff is kind of fun. And that's great, right? Like, we all get excited about new stuff, but I want to put something in perspective for you. Um, to go from a couple of projects that either have been very popular or will become very popular, it took Prometheus 18 months to get from version 1 to version 2, okay? It took Istio 15 months to get from alpha to 1.0. It's taken Knative nine months to get from zero to 0.5, right? We get very excited when the next KubeCon comes along and it's like, oh wow, lots of shiny objects, right? Squirrel. And we always kind of want to remind you guys that we are actively involved with all those projects. Uh, we want you to be excited about those projects, but they take a while to get into maturity. When they get to be fairly mature or we help them become mature, that's when you'll see them get into OpenShift. Can you run them on top of it because it's just a Kubernetes platform? Yeah, if you want to go experiment with it, absolutely. But I kind of want to put that into context that when you hear some announcement about something 0.1, um, it's going to take a while to get to a point where you're going to trust it to run your bank, your insurance company, your, your transportation company, whatever that might be. The other thing I always like to highlight to people is that it takes a while to get from upstream, open, uh, upstream Kubernetes to into production. And I highlight this not because we're necessarily super proud of how long it takes us or we're not happy with what it takes us. It takes everybody a long time to get this into production. If you are Google Cloud, you have one cloud to get it in one known environment. If you are AWS, you have one environment. If you are you know, VMware or Pivotal or Rock, it takes a while to stabilize the software. And nobody is really any different than there. It's taking people upwards of four or five months. Sometimes vendors skip a release in there. Um, so kind of. Uh, keep in mind how long it takes to make this software doable for you so that you don't have to worry about outages. You can worry about, you don't have to worry about scalability. You know stuff will just integrate. All right, so last piece before I go. Um, where is all this stuff going? I think you're going to hear more and more that the focus becomes less about Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is by no means done. There continue to be upgrades and enhancements and things that happen to core Kubernetes. But a lot of the work in this, in this space it's really kind of happening around Kubernetes, right? We're beginning to see some overlap between virtualization and containers uh, being managed by Kubernetes. We're beginning to see new ways of looking at sort of Kubernetes native pipelines. We're seeing um, some things that are Kubernetes specific around operations. Obviously, a lot of that gets baked into four. But we're seeing serverless. We're seeing service mesh. We're seeing developer experiences. None of those are part of, of Kubernetes. Those are things that are making Kubernetes better, but they're not part of Kubernetes. So if you're looking at you know, where's development happening, where are things expanding, uh, you're gonna begin to look outside of core Kubernetes. These are going to become things on top of Kubernetes, okay? 
So with that, I'm gonna kind of wrap this up real quick and bring the real smart people up on stage. If you enjoyed today, and you would like to enjoy today's kind of information on a more frequent basis, um, if you are a hands-on learner, learn.openshift.com, great way to go, basically get your own environments and test out all sorts of things, get experience and exposed to a lot of things. If you are a sort of visual learner, Diane does an awesome job every week. She does something called OpenShift Common Videos. They're on YouTube. Um, some of it is the, the partners and technology companies that we work with telling, talking about what they're doing, what's new in Kubernetes. Sometimes it's you know, uh, end users from the, from the community. Um, and I host a, a weekly, bi-weekly-ish uh, podcast about Kubernetes and, and OpenShift uh, called PodCTL. So if you learn that way or you, you, you're a podcast person, um, if you're a reader or you want to annoy your spouse on vacation, all of these books are available to you. Uh, most of them are free. Um, good reads. Uh, for the most part, um, they may be 3.x based. They will get updated to 4.x. You can expect to see books on operators and other things as well. So a lot of stuff out in the O'Reilly um, and uh, in Manning catalog for OpenShift. So with that, I'm going to bring up the product team. Guys, do you want to come up and, and take some questions? Thank you very much.